Um, we are midway through the, the lecture um, uh, where we're calling up SIR agent-based calibration. And uh, if we call up H SIR agent-based calibration, we're reflecting the event-driven nature of these models. The fact that any logic has an event-driven system, an event-driven scheduler, and so it runs more slowly when there's lots of events. And so you may remember this model um, where we seed a small population. Um, and you'll notice this events per second down here. The interesting thing is you'll notice that time is actually going to be slowing down. And I'll, I'll try to, um, excuse me, I'm going to go down here and I'm going to add in model time here so that um, time is, is shown. Um, Within the uh, within the model, and then I'm going to run it now. Okay, um, and you'll notice time is advancing quite quickly at first, um, but eventually what happens is it gets slower and slower um, in terms of how quickly it's advancing. So at first it was going by leaps and bounds, 10, 20 at a time. Now look, it's going one at a time. Can you see that? Okay, now it's going a little bit faster. And why is that occurring? Well, you notice uh, events per second here. Um, it's it's uh, it's got to process a lot a lot of events, and in fact, this step indicates the number of, of events involved. It goes slower because there's a lot of events going on, messages being sent from from one agent to its neighbors. So that's an indication of just how how event driven is um, the, the scheduler and how it impacts the real performance of these models. Um, so there's a couple ways of, of dealing with this. One is to lower the event frequency. Um, and uh, you can do more in the firing of each event. Use dynamic events, which um, are only used once and then uh, discarded. You can disable the events when they're not required rather than having them um, uh, firing. Um, and um, you can do bookkeeping on transitions rather than, well, okay, uh, statistics. That's something, excuse me, this, uh, th this is kind of all over the map. Let's talk about reducing events, this issue of uh, lowering event frequency. Sometimes there's simple example ways to reduce event occurrence. An example replacement there, you could have a model where people who are infected, infective, uh, send exposure messages to those around them. They send a message saying you're exposed to an infected person. And then, upon receipt, each of those has a likelihood beta of actually infecting the receiving person. Um, logically correct, no problem with it. But it's fairly computationally expensive because the number of people exposed could be quite large compared to the number of people infected. So a better performance here is rather than having these exposure messages set at rate alpha, say N, you know, uh, 10 per day, um, each having a likelihood beta, um, say beta is 0.1. Instead, you could send infect messages with rate alpha times beta, so 10 per day times 0.1, or 1 per day infect messages. Mathematically, it'll yield equivalent results with a lot fewer messages, a lot fewer messages. Um, so these simple types of simplifications are context specific. This transformation is much harder if the likelihood of infection given exposure varies by the individuals who are exposed, for example. But sometimes you can get away with sort of reducing the number of events. And the most important thing, ladies and gentlemen, is to note that events are expensive. Um, when they occur, it's not totally free. And if you can, don't treat them lightly. Disable actual explicit events if possible. Um, try to uh, not have transitions fired gratuitously, frequently, et cetera. So event-limited performance is one of the bottlenecks. Another bottleneck concerns statistics, and we, in fact, already talked about this. Um, this was really to Oscar's question earlier. Um, we have the capacity to find statistics over a population. The downside is each statistic, when called, if called, involves a full iteration through each member of the population. I'd like to illustrate this, just, just so you could see, see where this claim is coming from. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to go here to um, SAR agent-based calibration. Excuse me, I'm, I'm going to go up to this, to this early one. Um, and I'm going to go to people here, and I'm going to add a statistic, OK? Um, and um, 
I'm going to call it um, a fake statistic, so I don't have to type anything complex in it. I'm, I'm really trying to save time here. And it's going to count up the number of people in the population by counting one for each person in the population. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to, I'm going to build this. And oops, oops, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I, I didn't clean up after myself. This is this thing where I changed that uh, just to show what it was like to, uh, 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 to, to have multiple statistics. OK, so now, so oh, OK, it needs to true. It counts those who have a certain condition true. OK, fine. It's going to count all those. Uh, every person is counted. Um, we're inclusive. So, uh, OK, so there we have um, a model that, that compiles just fine. Now let's go look at main, and let's go look at the code for main, OK? Um, this is one of the things I say. Occasionally, you want to glance at this. Search, search for a fake statistic. Um, OK, here's uh, fake statistic. OK, and this is actually the code for fake statistic that it's generated. See, it's going through each person in the population, right? And if Boolean t equals true, where do you think that came from? Um, yeah, that was true. And then if it's true, then it increments this value. So this is just iterating through the population. So it bears, it bears emphasis that each calling each statistic requires a full iteration through each member of the computation. So each one, if you ask how many susceptible there are, I'll say, yes, sir. Um, are you susceptible? Are you susceptible? Are you susceptible? Are you susceptible? And it'll go all the way through. 10 million people all standing in line. And then it, you ask how many are infected, it'll go back to those. You know, are you? Are you? Are you? Uh, and it's a singularly wasteful thing. And so if you have 17 age categories, five year age categories and 80 plus, say, um, you're going to be doing 17 passes through the population for those things. Now, sometimes that may be acceptable for a smaller model. But sometimes it's not. And in fact, uh, have we time in this class? I have a little mechanism by which you could do it, as many of these statistics as you want, in a single pass. And it will, it will sort of compute them in a single pass in a flexible way. So statistics, treat them with caution. One thing you can do is replace those with that N infected type of strategy. N infected plus plus. Remember that strategy where each time you change between states, it, it increments the count or decrements the count. OK, another component that we found is visualization. So it turns out that visual representations of your model are great. And, and they're not eye candy. They are really helpful for understanding what's going on when you have a small number of people. And that's important because it can help you spot bugs. It can help you spot um, uh, unexpected effects, counterintuitive behavior. Those are things that are important, but you have to realize it takes time and memory. And if you want a population that's, say, of size a million, you will want to expand this so that, um, oh, excuse me, you want to be able to disable this so that you don't have to visualize a million things in your screen because it, it probably won't be very meaningful to look at in the first place. And it will probably take a lot of memory and a lot of computational power just to display them. There's actually a lot of work involved just to kind of get it to show up. And just as an example of this, imagine the dynamic properties. Do you remember dynamic properties for those visual events where it updates automatically its size based on the person's age, or it updates, you know, its color based on their current situation, or it updates um, uh, updates the the uh, text location based on a slider or whatever. These are dynamic properties and they take some update associated with them. So disabling visualization could lead to much faster operation. I'm not saying build models with no visualization. I think that really cut short opportunities for insight and learning. But you, you want to be able to disable it. And one thing I note is that when it comes to visualizations, if you go look here, for example, um, and you look at the, um, excuse me, these are not good models to show it. But if you look at a case where people have presentations, you can actually tell it to ignore the presentation. You can select the presentation and tell it to ignore that. OK, we're most of the way through this. I'm just going to go through two more. One is network construction. This is surprising to me. 
But we found that any logic scale free network requires a, a construction, requires a long time to run. We implemented it ourselves and found it much faster to implement, uh, use our own implementation. I don't know what's going on there. Maybe their algorithm is much more general or whatever. All I will say is that um, sometimes we've run models with tens of thousands of people and it'll take several minutes just to build the network at the beginning. And after that, it's fine. After that, it's, it's quite quick. Just be aware, that sometimes that sucks up time. Final thing is data, uh, data output, outputting data. Um, uh, when you're outputting data to a database or to a file, it can take time. Um, and uh, some suggestions here, you can batch up data. So instead of calling the database for this little piece of data, then later for that, for this, that, you can actually send one big call to the database to do a bunch of inserts into the database. For those who have never seen databases before, don't worry about this too much, but suffice it to say, you can either do a bigger chunk of work or a smaller chunk of work at a time, and it's faster to do a bigger chunk at one time. Um, you can use a local database rather than going over the network. That will really help because network latency adds a lot. Um, you record a smaller subset of the data instead of recording things over time. Maybe you just want to record the thing at the final value um, within the model. You record less frequently, less frequently spaced if you are recording it over time, and fewer, fewer sort of uh, types of data. I think that's really the smaller subset. Um, models with large populations can require much space. And the evidence, uh, anecdotal evidence from my experience is that when visualizations are enabled, this amount of space is really much, much larger. Um, an important thing here is that if you go to the experiment on a per experiment basis, go to experiment, um, and uh, you go to advanced, you'll notice it says maximum available memory. You can set this to uh, different, uh, different amounts. And it may make a real difference. One thing you'll notice is that, um, and I'll try to see it. We may or may not see it for, for this one here. Um, let's say that I lower this, for example, from 300 to 128. I'm going to lower this, this uh, agent-based, SAR agent-based in this, in this kind of space here. And you'll notice it shows the amount of memory here. And you notice it's getting red. Um, and uh, it's, it's actually having some real um, trouble sort of doing it so efficiently here. It has to do what's called garbage collection, which is going to take a lot of time. Um, and you can actually tell it to run garbage collection to lower, lower it. That cleans up extra objects that are still sitting around that don't need to be. But you notice when it's red, it's getting quite memory constrained. And that takes quite a bit of time to clean up. And it also uh, can lead to it running out of memory. So this whole property within the advanced tab of a maximum amount of memory available is pretty important. By contrast, if I gave it a lot more memory um, and I were to run it, it, uh, it might be able to run without running out of memory and thereby run, run run quite a bit um, faster. You see that's uh, not, not quite as slow in terms of sort of going between um, with garbage collection and so on. And this tells how much it's, it's using at the current time. Um, OK, so um, some uh, reflections there. Um, ways to reduce space demand, uh, accumulate less data over time. Um, write data out rather than accumulating the data sets. Data sets accumulate a bunch of memory, and if you're accumulating a lot of things in them, they can take um, take a lot of effort. OK, a final slide here. Um, and I appreciate your patience. Um, so it turns out that agent-based modeling, um, particularly because of the need to run multiple realizations of a given iteration, as it were, of the model, to use that terminology, um, it has lots of opportunities for parallel processing. What I mean by that is running several runs of the model in parallel without any need to communicate between them. Um, so if you want to run the same model, same assumptions about parameters, but different random number seeds, there's no really no need for them to communicate. You can just go and send them off. They're, they're different solitudes. They could just go off and run on their own, and you can harvest the results. So this is what we call in computer science embarrassingly parallel. It's easy to exploit. Um, 
Uh, you can just run different realizations of a model, say on different cores or on different um, machines. Um, now, there's a harder type of parallelism that you can exploit, and some of my colleagues are working to do this. But basically, different agents may be loosely connected. You may have agents over here that could run more or less in parallel with agents over here, with only occasional connection. And agent processing can, in principle, be parallelized, um, but it's more challenging because of dependencies between agents. But in calibration, there's also a chance to, cal to parameterize different iterations, different components. When you're evaluating different points in space, you could potentially, instead of you know, first starting over here, being dropped off in, um, near the Rockies and, and doing it and then being dropped off in Death Valley and doing it and being dropped off in the Ganges Plain, instead of doing one after the other after the other as whole sort of sequences of exploration, you could be doing both to, at the same time. And, and that, can, that can offer a lot of opportunities. So one thing that you folks will see during your professional careers, nay, even in the next five to 10 years, I will predict big time, is a combination of this properties, desirable properties, the ability to parallelize things with cloud computing. Cloud computing offers us um, what's sometimes known as utility computing, the capacity to sort of tap into arbitrarily large amounts of computing power when needed, where someone else maintains the machine, someone else maintains the infrastructure, the um, uh, takes care of, of sort of the software needed to run it, and we can just make use of it in the same way when we plug in our plug to the wall, we can make use of the electricity without, real, without needing to run a power plant ourselves. Most of us don't run a power plant, perhaps you folks are exceptions, but um, uh, the point is, um, P cloud computing combined with agent-based modeling um, is a powerful combination because it promises to significantly reduce the cost associated with running agent-based models and to open up the opportunities for something closer to interactive exploration of the models, the sort of interactive expo exploration we do see with, um, with aggregate models right now to good effect. And those things are very important when dealing with stakeholders and with, uh, with getting intuitions for how a model is operating. So they're not merely niceties. Okay, so those are my comments on the, um, on the uh, front of the, uh, of the performance. Uh, big picture here, agent-based modeling is expensive because of the need to run multiple realizations and many moving parts. And it has a significant impact on our insight and opportunity costs and inhibits adoption. And then we hit each of these uh, different, uh, different issues. Next week, we're going to be looking at the use of a tool that will show, give you hints as to where computation is spending its time. But to do that, we're going to have to hit the next topic, which is um, this notion of, of, of uh, how methods work and in Java and how one method calls another um, and makes use of something called a call stack. Um, so we're going uh, to be seeing this sort of construct uh, next time when you have multiple calls. And once you understand that, you'll, you'll come to understand uh, some of the output from the profiler. And you can use that to understand where the model is, is getting bogged down. Okay? So that's all uh, for today. Um, and uh, we'll be meeting...